chapter 10 and um, as we study our uh, continue our study in the in the book of Daniel we get to a very uh, important uh, portion of scripture another uh, in a sense prayer of Daniel like we saw in chapter 9 but in this case it's uh, uh, it's really a, a response or a vision that he gets in response to prayer and um, and like I said a very uh, a very important one very practical one for us as as believers well let's we'll pray and then we'll get into our text. Father, we do just lift this time before you that uh, once again through your word you speak to our hearts and, and, uh, and help us to understand and to realize the uh, important implications of, of what's said in this text. Daniel's experience, what he goes through, the vision he has, the introduction to really the rest of the book, but uh, more importantly, uh, a glimpse into the heavenlies and the idea of spiritual warfare. So we pray that uh, Again, you speak to our hearts through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I, uh, uh, years ago when uh, I could still afford to take my kids to uh, UH football games, I mean, it used to be like 750 or something to go sit in the end zones. And uh, when they were little, four or five or six, we would, uh, uh, we'd go and, uh, and then they, they loved the games. Of course, what they loved was throwing confetti in the air, you know, throwing the toilet paper roll off the top deck. Uh, eating the hot dogs, you know, doing the tailgate thing. They loved the football games. Of course, they didn't realize that actually down there in the middle somewhere, <laughs> there was actually a game <laughs> taking place, and that was actually why we were there. Uh, a lot of Christians are like that in regards to spiritual warfare. They, they know the Lord, they're in the church, and they're kind of caught up with all the peripherals. They don't even realize there's a warfare going on, uh, that there is a battle going on, much less how they're to engage the enemy and participate in the whole thing. And that's what we see uh, in Daniel chapter 10. The other extreme of this, though, probably should be pointed out, and that is the, the person, the Christian, that, that sees uh, a, a spiritual entity in, in everything that happens and is done and said. You know, every time the gate squeaks, <coughs> I think it has a demon in it. You know, <laughs> you know that's, that's the extreme. Everything is spiritual warfare, you know. Oh, I've got a bad cold, man. Satan's really beating me up. No, I think you just got a cold. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's like we can go to one extreme that everything is for this reason and this is why it's happening. Uh, and at the other time, we can go to the extreme and ignore it altogether as though there isn't sp spiritual warfare uh, and there isn't something that we can, uh, can do about it. Let's take a look at uh, uh, Daniel uh, verses 1 to 3. I've broken it down to seven points. Daniel receives a a vision from the Lord. Verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called uh, Belshazzar. His message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three we weeks were over. And uh, in terms of the vision, a couple of things. The first one, we see that he receives the uh, vision uh, as an old man. It's the third year of the reign of, of Cyrus. This would place it around uh, 535, 536 B.C. and uh, would mean that Daniel now has been in the Babylonian captivity for about 72 years. 72 years? Yeah, uh, Ezra's already gone back at this point. Cyrus comes to the throne, and you remember uh, prophesied that, uh, that uh, a man named Cyrus would one day uh, be the, uh, uh, the ruler over uh, the, uh, the captive uh, Jews. And in fact, he would be the one that would give uh, the command and allow them to return uh, to rebuild the temple. And, uh, and he was a bit flabbergasted when they opened the scroll and showed him the portion of scripture that predicted 
him by name hundreds of years before he was born, and uh, uh, he did, in fact, allow them to go back. Daniel didn't go back because he's, two reasons, I think, at least 85 or more. He's at least 85 or older, and it would have been a, certainly a difficult journey in that day for him to make. Secondly, I think he realized that he still holds a prominent position within the government. He's made it through two empires. Again, prime minister of the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he still is held in high esteem uh, through the son and the grandson ruling until their demise. Uh, and now under Darius and now under Cyrus, uh, he uh, obviously holds a very high position and probably figures that he can do more good by staying and maintaining that position and watching over what turned out to be most of the Jewish population that did not return with, uh, with uh, Ezra. Secondly, uh, the, the vision that Daniel gets concerns a long period of time. Now, uh, NIV says uh, uh, it, it would be involve a great war. Uh, New King James uses the term, but the appointed time was long. And it's really uh, the idea of both. It would be a long period of time, uh, and it would be involved a great struggle or a great war. Now, uh, he's going to tell us that it has to do with, uh, with, with Israel, uh, with the Jews, with their nation, with their future. And the vision is the rest of the book. It's chapter 11, it's chapter 12. He begins telling them about how many Persian kings there would be. He goes on into the Greek empire and the battle between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Uh, he gives great details, even mentioning Cleopatra and all the intrigue of these kings and trying to overtake each other and their tremendous persecution of both empires uh, against the, the Jews. The vision continues all the way to the last world empire who we refer to as the, uh, the Antichrist during the tribulation period and the return of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. That's what we're going to be looking at in the coming weeks. Uh, he's an old man when he receives the vision, and uh, it's uh, a vision that concerns uh, a long time period. Take a look at chapter 12 if you want to go over just a, a couple of pages to your right. In verse 4, uh, there it says, But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase in knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others. These two other spiritual beings, angels, one on this bank of the river, one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, and uh, we're going to identify him in a moment, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was the, uh, above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, times and a half, uh, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. And again, the times, time and a half, identifying that last uh, seven and a half uh, year period of the tribulation. Verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. So uh, this vision is going to begin with uh, the naming of the, uh, how many Persian kings there are still to come in this empire and it goes to uh, the time of the end. Uh, we also note that uh, Daniel received the vision and answered to prayer. He's been fasting uh, and praying for three weeks now, and he, he mentions uh, <clears throat> the type of fast that it, that it was, and we'll, we'll tie that idea. It's very important to understand that he was fasting and praying for three weeks or 21 days as we uh, get further in our text. So <clears throat> he receives a vision, and then secondly, we would say that Daniel describes the messenger of the vision uh, as our redeemer. And that's going to need some explanation as we get to verses 4 to 6. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing up, excuse me, standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris. I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like crystallite. His face was like lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. So here uh, Daniel describes the messenger in uh, chapter 12 we just read. There's three uh, entities that are there. There's the, the one in linen that he's just described above the waters. There's uh, one on the opposite bank, one on the, uh, the, the bank near him. Uh, this one gives a description. And if I were to just uh, read you the description alone, <clears throat> that he's dressed in linen, gold sash, 
Uh, body was like chrysolite, face like lightning, eyes like flaming torches, legs and arms like burnished bronze. His voice is like the sound of a multitude or like the sound of rushing waters. Uh, and I would say, who is he describing? Well, if you studied the book of Revelation at all, you'd say he's describing Jesus Christ. Uh, and, uh, and certainly that's what we see when, when John has a vision of Jesus in heaven in the opening chapter of Revelation. And don't take my word for it. Let's, uh, let's read it. Verse 12. This is uh, John the Apostle writing, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden menorahs or lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His uh, head and hair were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet was like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a, a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in Hades." So it's uh, in, in just those two readings, it's, it's easy to see the parallel uh, and the reaction of Daniel and John is that both they fall on their face as though uh, dead, having this vision. And certainly in John's clearly identified as Jesus. I'm the first and the last. I was a dead. Now I'm alive and uh, live forever and ever. I hold the keys of death in, in Hades. Um, where people have a problem identifying this messenger, the man in linen, uh, which again represents holiness, uh, above the waters here in uh, at least a portion of this conversation with Daniel, the, it's easy in a sense to identify him as our Redeemer, as Jesus, as the Messiah. It's what we'd call a pre-incarnate appearance uh, in the Old Testament. The trouble that some have with it is uh, actually comes later in our text because there's going to be the mention of the fact that in answer to Daniel's prayer, his Daniel, uh, Daniel's prayed and he's going to say, your prayer was heard the first day. When, when our prayers are spoken, the Bible said God hears them right then. But he says there was resistance in, uh, in, uh, in bringing uh, the answer to the prayer, resistance by another spiritual entity identified as the, uh, the prince of Persia. And so uh, some would say, so how can this be our redeemer? How can this be Jesus, the son of God, and yet meets resistance? Why didn't he just wipe, wipe the guy out and come with the answer to the prayer? I think there's two pretty good uh, uh, explanations for that. And I do hold, obviously, to the fact that I think that this is, uh, is Jesus Christ. Uh, one, is the simple, one simple explanation is that based on Daniel 12, there are three entities there. And so the one speaking that was being resisted may not have been, obviously, uh, Jesus in, in coming with this, this prophecy, with this vision and answer to Daniel's prayer. Uh, the other one is, uh, is very simple as well, uh, that uh, God can do whatever he wants to do. Uh, and it, certainly he could choose uh, to allow a delay in answer to the prayer that he might teach Daniel and us a very important lesson. And that is that our prayers are tied directly to a warfare that's going on in the heavenlies. And I think that that's the, one of the uh, overreaching important really things that are being said uh, in this text. And there's good people on both sides of this and so forth. Either way, it doesn't change what the message is and, and, uh, and really the primary application for us uh, in the text. So <clears throat> uh, how many are on my side and believe that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ? I, uh, so, and by good people, I mean people that believe and teach the Bible, the Word of God. I don't even count the guys that uh, don't believe that the, the Bible is inspired by God. But, um, but I think that the, uh, the evidence is clear, at least in my own mind, the identification. And, and I, in either way, I think uh, the point needs to be made that we clearly understand that uh, when we get to heaven someday and we see Jesus, he's, we're going to see him as John saw him. 
where I can see him as a hippie guy with kind of kick back with this robe and groovy leather uh, sandals. I think that was appealing to the, uh, the, the hippie generation, you know, that I was a part of. Of course, uh, some of them identify themselves as flower children. I was more like a weed, I think. I never quite <laughs> made it all the way there. But uh, Jesus isn't going to be like that uh, in, in heaven. He's going to appear the same way he did to, uh, to, to John as the glorified Savior uh, in the same way that I believe he appeared to, to Daniel. And I think even as we worship the Lord and, and pray in Jesus' name and understand who he really is, uh, again, he always existed as God and he laid aside that glorified being in appearance and took on human flesh and was born uh, as a baby in the manger. And then after his perfect sinless life, his death and his resurrection, then he took on that glorified state uh, once, once again. He, he reveals it for a, a glimpse to Peter, James, and John, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. It's like uh, Jesus there peels back the physical realm, allows them to look into the spiritual realm, and they see Jesus in his glorified body. What do they do? Same thing. <laughs> they just fall down uh, on their, on their uh, faces, of course, you know, Peter famous for one-liners. He's got to finally say something at the end about building a tabernacle there and so forth. But um, here uh, the, the message comes, and I believe it's, uh, it comes from uh, Jesus himself. Daniel, uh, again, receives a vision. Uh, it's, uh, I think, the, I believe the messenger is our redeemer. And three, Daniel's reaction to the messenger is uh, severe. We'll see that in verses 7 and 9. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at the great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. So uh, we see first that Daniel's uh, associates, uh, their reaction was that of terror and uh, uh, we have no reason to believe that these are believers with him or anything. Uh, this is a guy that's a, a very high-ranking government official. He's not in his resident. He's not uh, really even in the capital. He's much further north on the banks of the Tigris uh, River. Uh, those that are with him, they really don't understand. They really can't see. But they're, just their reaction is to uh, run in terror because uh, of, of the vision. Now, in the book of Revelation, we get the same kind of reaction by, by unbelievers to, to Jesus uh, as well in Revelation 6, 12. Uh, there it says, again, the apostle John writing, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. This is during the, this horrific period of time of God's pouring his judgment out on a Christ-rejecting world, and, uh, and it's in the midst of that tribulation, uh, the idea of the, the sixth seal judgment. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky uh, uh, fell to earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its, its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath had come and who can stand? Uh, this horrific... Uh, Time is being played out on planet Earth, and, uh, and there's actually people that recognize that this is a judgment of God, and rather than crying out for his mercy, they're just crying for the rocks to fall on them and, and hide from them. In John's day, in the future, that vision, again, similar reaction to those that are with Daniel, uh, to run and hide in terror. Daniel's reaction was different. It was uh, very physical. Notice he had no strength left. His face turned pale. He said he was uh, helpless. Daniel, he fell into a deep sleep uh, until the messenger uh, spoke to him and, uh, and so forth. We were uh, uh, visiting with one of the guys uh, yesterday that had a heart attack a couple of weeks ago, and he's uh, recovering. We went over to visit with him, but he was just talking about uh, that, the whole physical experience of that and how it, um, you're just so helpless. You're, you're you feel your life ebbing away. Uh, the, the breaths are getting tougher and more shallow. And you, he, he really thought he was just, it was that time he was going to be with the Lord. Uh, uh, he said, I, I, 
He goes, uh, I wouldn't want you have to go through that physically. That was no fun. Spiritually, it was a blessing, though, he says, because I had a total peace. I'm just, well, Lord, if it's time, then I'll be with you, and that'll be great. And he just said, he said, just looking back, it was just an incredible spiritual experience because of the peace that God gave him. And he said, you'd think you'd be just freaking out, right? Because you, you feel like you're dying, and you're helpless. There's nothing you can do. But he had a tremendous peace. Well, Daniel is, is going through something like that, and he's uh, uh, about when he feels like he's going to just ebb away, uh, then he hears the voice. He falls into uh, uh, a deep sleep. He says, um, uh, again, it was like he was dying. Now, again, John, in the uh, passage we read from Revelation, when he has the vision of the risen Lord there and, and describes him in very, very uh, graphic, very prophetic uh, language, he says, I was like a, a dead man. And remember uh, prophet Isaiah, when he has got a vision of the Lord in the year King Uzziah, his friend, died, he says, I had a vision of the Lord. And he says, I felt like I was becoming undone. And that uh, word in the Hebrew means uh, uh, disintegrated as opposed to something coming together. It's flying apart. And that's how he described himself in terms of being in the presence of God. Jesus said, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see the face of God. That's about as poor in spirit as you can get <laughs> when you're uh, that humble before uh, the Lord. And, uh, uh, and, and certainly... Uh, Daniel's uh, reaction is, is very different, but we're going to see that Daniel 4, Daniel's strength was restored by the messenger. And, and uh, hang in with me. We're going to get some application here. Verses 10 to 11. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this, I stood up trembling. So obviously, uh, Daniel needed to be restored because uh, fear had come upon him. He's restored by two things, the touch of Jesus and the words of Jesus. And uh, there's times in our lives when fear comes upon us. <laughs> uh, it could be because of physical things, uh, uh, like our brother was going through. It could be just circumstances of, of life. Uh, but the, the what ifs of life, you know, something happens and our mind can just start doing the and if that happened, maybe this, and if that happens, then maybe, and we can just really uh, run with it and be paralyzed, I think, uh, not only physically, but uh, in terms of anxiety and so forth, but certainly spiritually be paralyzed by fear. And I think what brings us around is the same thing, the touch of Jesus and, and the words of Jesus. But again, I want to jump down to verse 15 to 19 because it's not all over. Uh, you know, Daniel was able to get up to his hands and knees a little bit, but he's still, still trembling. And notice how the Lord deals with him in verse 15. He says, while he was uh, saying this to me, I bowed with my face towards the ground and was speechless. Then the one who looked like uh, a man touched my lips and opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid. Oh, man highly esteemed, he said, shalom or peace. Be strong now. Be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, speak, my Lord, since you've given me strength. And, and I think the point is here, like us, Daniel had to be touched a second time. Uh, Daniel needed to be encouraged by uh, the word of the Lord uh, uh, a second time. Uh, fear overcomes us. Sometimes uh, for Daniel here, it was physical. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, uh, it's in many other ways that we can simply become uh, paralyzed with the concerns uh, of life. And though we're a believer and, and we've walked with the Lord for uh, a while, uh, boy, there's just times when we need the touch of the Lord again. We need to hear the words of the Lord again to be encouraged. And, and uh, we see a similar thing in the New Testament with uh, a man that was uh, blind and brought before Jesus in Mark 8, 22. Uh, again, this idea of requiring a second touch from the Lord. There it says they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. <laughs> when he had spit in the man's eye and put his hands on him, Jesus said, do you see anything? Keep waiting for someone to start the spit in your eye ministry, but it hasn't quite happened yet. Could catch on though. Uh, he looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw 
everything clearly. Uh, there's just times I think we need to hear from the Lord and hear God's love. Uh, again, these words, you're, you're, you're beloved, you're highly esteemed. Daniel, you're, you're loved. Now, back in chapter 9 in that prayer, uh, in that vision, in that answer, uh, he heard the day that he prayed, he heard the vision. And remember at that time, that messenger bringing that vision again says to Daniel, this older man that so faithfully walked with the Lord all these years, that Daniel, you're loved. And, uh, and we saw the, uh, the, the wonderful aspect of, of prayer, that it's based on God's mercy and based on the fact that he loves us. The same for Daniel is the same for us. But so often we need to be uh, encouraged when God's working in our lives because there is a resistance to us. And we're going to talk about that spiritual resistance uh, in just a moment. Uh, one more passage, kind of a classic one, Joshua. Joshua's, you know, the protege of Moses. He's, he's a guy that's walked through uh, uh, the Red Sea on dry ground. I mean, he's seen all the miracles in Egypt as a young guy. <laughs> I like this. As a, the Bible calls him and Caleb young men. I used to think that meant they were teenagers. You know how they were? That means they were about 40. <laughs> Biblically, if you're about 40, you're still a young guy. It makes me like middle-aged, barely, barely not a young guy. Uh, anyway, Joshua and Caleb, remember, they're the two spies. There's 12 spies. They go in. They come back. They're the only two with a good report. I mean, tremendous man of faith, Joshua. Now it's his turn to lead the people. Notice his spiritual condition. Uh, Joshua 1.6, hear the Lord saying to him uh, through this angel, be strong and courageous. Uh, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you? <laughs> be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Uh, do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. Why did he say that? Because he was terrified. <laughs> because he was discouraged. Anytime the Bible says, don't be terrified, it's because they are. <laughs> and uh, even though he... This is a very mature believer, a tremendous leader, you know, and the leader. He's the man. I mean, he's, he's the leader. And yet, uh, yeah, but they've got walled cities. Remember his testimony before? You know, it's like, it, God's with us. You know, we can do it. And now that he's in that position after the wandering in the wilderness for about 40 years, he's like, well, I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty sure, you know, God's going to go with us, you know, and, and not quite the faith he had at one time. And, and, uh, Man, we can, we can be like that. Uh, we can get so caught up and so paralyzed by fear and anxiety and, and so forth at times that uh, our, our faith kind of goes out, out the window. And, and I'm not talking about, un, I'm talking about unfounded fear. I'm not talking about a truck's coming and you're afraid, you get a little adrenaline and you jump out of the way. That fear is good. That's good fear. Uh, this is unfounded fear when, when there's no rational explanation for it. Uh, there's no reason to think that, that uh, because uh, God had done all these miraculous things in the life, life of Joshua, uh, that suddenly he was going to abandon him uh, at this point. That, that's, not even, that's not even rational to, to believe. Uh, and yet in our own lives, you know, we can look back on God's faithfulness, his care. Uh, he died for us. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He makes all these promises to us. And we look back and, well, yeah, he's pretty, pretty good for his word so far, but this could be different this time. You know, you don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we can just melt away in, in terms of all that God's done for us, like, like a Joshua. And, um, and if the Lord's got to come to him and tell him, didn't I say, be strong and be courageous? Did I mention this again? Be strong and courageous. Stop being terrified. Uh, I think the same applies for us. A couple of things in, in uh, this regard, three principles. And one is certainly to realize the source of your fear. 2 Timothy 1.6, or excuse me, 1.7, very good verse to memorize. For the spirit, uh, for God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of love and power uh, and self-discipline. When we're overcome with an unfounded fear, and again, this is all leading to really a study on spiritual warfare and this resistance that's been going on in the heavenlies. When we're going through a time of, of kind of irrational fear, uh, we need to come back to the reality, that's not the Lord. <laughs> what I'm experiencing right now, what I'm feeling right now is not from the Lord. I just need to simply realize uh, the source of it. And, uh, and it's really uh, very often uh, when it's unfounded, it's 
It's just from the enemy. Uh, it's what we'd call an attack from the enemy where now we're engaged in spiritual warfare. But again, if we're, uh, we're, we're so preoccupied like the kids at the football game with the peripherals of what's going on and the show and the food and we don't even know there's a game on, then we're, we're just getting hammered and we're not really sure what to do. Uh, secondly, uh, remember the promise of Jesus that I just mentioned and it's in Hebrews 13:5. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What, what, what can man do to me? Uh, hey, rem and that's not certainly not the only one, but to remember, uh, remember the source of the fear, remember the promises of God, and then uh, rejoice in, in the love of Jesus. Uh, God says to Daniel chapter 9, also chapter 10, in the midst of his fear, hey, uh, highly, you who are highly esteemed, you who are the beloved, you who are greatly loved. Uh, Romans 5, 8 is the cross reference I've got for you here. <laughs> but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we could go on and on. John three sixteen, all the verses that talk about God's love. You know, who can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus and uh, in Romans 8 and, and so forth. So Daniel receives a vision uh, I believe it's a, a vision of our Redeemer. His reaction is severe, uh, but he's restored uh, by this messenger. And then we find out that the messenger has been uh, re resisted as he comes to deliver uh, the vision. And that's in verses 12 and 13. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God. Your words were her heard, and I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. So what's going on here? Well, first simply, Daniel's told that the answer to his prayer was resisted. Uh, he set his mind in prayer to gain understanding, to humble himself before God. And we're told that as soon as he prayed, God heard his prayer. And what was on Daniel's heart? Well, in response, we know the answer had everything to do with uh, the Jews and the nation of Israel and what will happen. What will their outcome be? What will the future be? Why would he be praying that? Because as you read the book of Ezra, things aren't going too good right now. Ezra returns back with a handful, uh, you know, a few thousand to re rebuild the temple. Uh, and they're, they're getting a lot of resistance there. They're getting the little threats by, you know, neighboring people groups and so forth that still want their demise and, uh, and so forth. Uh, men like Haggai, the prophet, are on the scene uh, and basically saying, uh, oh, by the way, didn't you guys come back here to rebuild the temple? I just happen to notice your houses are look, looking like really good. <laughs> but the temple is still in shambles. I don't know if you ever caught this other correlation. Do you have enough money at the end of the month? This is what... I'm, of course, I'm uh, paraphrasing just a little bit here from Haggai the prophet, but that's what he says. He says, your purses have holes in them. Did you, you kind of figure that out? Uh, I think you forgot why, why you were here, why God brought you here. So this is going on. It's not going well. Of course, Daniel's watching the news every night or may have gotten some email concerning this. <laughs> no, it took a little longer to get news, but uh, I'm sure he's getting it. And he's more than a little concerned, and that's kind of prompts his prayer and fasting for, uh, for 21 days. Uh, God hears the answer the first day. It's resisted for, uh, for three weeks here. And uh, uh, at least this helps us understand why sometimes we don't get an immediate answer to our prayers. And uh, God hears it the first day. Sometimes there's some resistance uh, on the wire coming back the other way. Secondly, Daniel's told that the prince of Persia is the source of the resistance, and it's been going on for, for 21 days. And again, just to make the, the obvious a little more obvious, how long was he fasting and praying? 21 days. How long was, did it take to get the answer to the prayer? Uh, 21 days. I think there's a point here. We're supposed to see the correlation between Daniel's fasting and praying and what was going on in, in the heavenlies. It kind of makes you wonder, what if he quit after 20 days? <laughs> he doesn't quit until the answer comes. That's, uh, that's the point. There's a direct correlation between Daniel's prayer and his in engagement and his relationship with God, his concern 
over God's people, God's nation, what's going on, and what's happening in the heavenlies with these uh, spiritual entities. Again, who is the prince of Persia? Well, he is a, a satanic entity. He's one of Satan's uh, leaders. In this case, he's over a particular uh, nation. The, uh, the book of Revelation says that uh, in the end, what we call the battle of Armageddon, nations are, are brought together to, uh, to engage in this tremendous battle on the plains of Megiddo. And, uh, and it says that uh, uh, evil spirits are what influence the leaders to drive them uh, to that point. And uh, we, we live in a day and age when we scratch our heads as to why leaders of nations do what they do. Sometimes we go, well, it must be politically motivated, or don't they get it? Don't they understand? Don't they realize what's, what's happening uh, in, in the world? We've, uh, we've seen since, uh, uh, since Israel became a nation in particular, uh, and, and their struggle to exist, uh, and, and, and we've had it reported that it was an Arab-Israeli conflict. <laughs> Half the Arabs are Christians. It's not an Arab-Israeli conflict. It's a Muslim. It's an Islamic conflict with, uh, with the Jewish people that have been come back in the land. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've heard it uh, taught that uh, there was a Palestinian people. There's no Palestinian people. They're part of Jordan. There's not a Palestinian language. There's not a Palestinian culture. There's not a Palestinian anything. But, it, but these things are all perpetrated. And, and leaders are like intelligent people. It's like... Does anybody interview anybody, first source, read anything, know any history? Uh, we've got leaders of nations that do things that kind of boggle, boggle the mind. Why, why do these things go on uh, the way they are? Why, why do people seem to live in, in a delusion sometimes when it comes to foreign policy? Well, the Bible says there are satanic entities, and these are the heavyweights that are influencing world leaders. Sometimes we might say, I'm... Man, I'm having a, a terrible day, man. Satan was just beating me up all day today. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, there's only one of him, and there's all the millions of people in the world, but today he's chosen you. No, he's probably, you know, hanging out with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad or one of those guys, you know. <laughs> they, they appear to be slightly more evil than you, you know. There's, there's some other influence that we can't, uh, can't explain or whatever. But uh, here, the, the prince of Persia is a satanic entity, a person that is seeking to influence uh, that particular kingdom. Uh, <clears throat> this messenger, again, uh, the Lord will also say, now I'm going to return to the fight, but the prince of Greece is coming because that's the next world empire. And there will be a, a satanic entity, a very powerful one that is over that particular kingdom as well. How do we know? Because they persecuted the Jews like crazy and tried to completely wipe them off uh, the planet once, a, once again. But again, the next part of this is Daniel's told that Michael came to help because of the resistance. Uh, he is referred to as the uh, chief uh, of the princes. He's also referred to other places in the Bible as the, the archangel, not a archangel, the archangel. Uh, he is the, the highest ranking angel. He is the chairman of the joint chief of staff of God's military. He's the man. He's, uh, or the angel in this case, at the very, very top. And he apparently is assigned in particular to the nation of, uh, of Israel. And again, we live in a physical world and that we can see and smell and touch and so forth. But there's a, a spiritual world that is just as real that's out there. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 10. If, uh, and I've got those verses for you there. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical struggle, but against the rulers that we've just spoken about, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul's describing a, a hierarchy of, uh, of spiritual entities that are basically there to carry out Satan's orders and, and his plans. It's interesting in verse 11 when he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That term does not mean against his schemes generically, like he's got these generic plans for the world that are evil, though uh, they might be able to be categorized. Paul's talking about something very individual. In other words, he says, Satan has got an individual scheme against you. 
in particular. He knows you. He knows your weaknesses. He's watching you. He's observing you. And he's got a particular scheme, a way to trip you up, a way to stumble you in your faith in Christ, a way to make you <laughs> less less zealous for the Lord or more concerned about the, less concerned about the lost or whatever it might, any thing he can do to sideline you to destroy your faith. He's got a plan and he's patient, man. He is really patient. He waited for decades for David, right? David's a young guy, teenage guy, loved the Lord, wrote the Psalms. So he saw him as of Israel and he watched him. He watched him for years, years, years. At the apex of, of his kingdom then in his weakness, boom, then Satan he drops the plan and, and uh, trips David up in terms of the sin with, with Bathsheba. But uh, uh, so there's a plan out there. There's a, there's a battle going on, whether we want to ignore it. We don't want to go to the extreme. And I and, uh, think there's a demon behind every door. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to ignore this uh, completely. Uh, otherwise, we're going to suffer uh, different residual effects of this warfare that's taking place. And we won't understand what's going on. Why are we fighting so much? I told you there should only be seven cookbooks on that shelf. Why are there eight? You know, these really big, important issues in marriage. You know, we, we get, you know, some of the stuff we argue about is like ridiculous. That spoon is on the cabinet again and it's dirty. I told you about that. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, wait, what are we doing here? You know, it's like when there's these unfounded, illogical, doesn't make sense kinds of irritations or fear going on, again, you need to kind of maybe take a step back and go, ah, 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 we're under attack here. You know, we need, we need to do some praying, some heavy duty praying because this makes no sense at all. We're not, we're not the enemy here. <laughs> uh, he's out there. You know, we're kind of attacking it. We got to Attack not that which is flesh and blood, but, but this is a scheme from the enemy. And we need to engage in the battle. We need to begin to pray. It doesn't mean that we don't have dumb arguments because we're dumb. Speaking of the guys, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but it does mean that Satan will come in and attack your marriage and attack your children and attack our church and attack our culture and attack the, the people that we're trying to reach with the, <laughs> the love of Jesus Christ. I appreciate it when people in the community on the Wimmer side get together on a Sunday afternoon and walk uh, Kamehameha Highway and hold up signs saying that we don't want crack in our neighborhood and we're against drugs and da 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 da. It's like I appreciate the sentiment, but that, that won't, that's not really going to help that much. What's, what's going to take is people getting on their knees because that is a ploy of the enemy to destroy people's lives. It's a spiritual battle. It works its way out in physical ways. But anytime somebody is being lied, uh, their lives are being stolen, they are being cheated uh, of their lives and their livelihood and their families, uh, Satan's behind it. And, uh, and again, we live in a world that is, the Bible says, is anti-Christ or against Christ. Uh, but Satan is out doing his best <laughs> to make it worse. We have our own selfish sin nature. And boy, does, uh, does he know how to play those two things uh, against us at times. And we need to uh, kind of wake up and smell the coffee, so, so to speak. There's um, kind of a, a funny book that came out uh, many years ago called uh, A Gospel Blimp. And uh, here the, the warning is about trying to do, do church uh, in a way that uh, is not relying upon these, these uh, physical uh, relying on the physical instead of the spiritual. The Gospel Blimp, a, a guy wrote the book because they decided they were in a community. Nobody knew uh, who they were, where they were, what their church was all about and so forth. So they, it was on the mainland. So they got a, you can buy them those big helium filled blimps things and you, you float them up like car salesmen, used car places. Use them if you've been on the mainland, you've probably seen them around. <clears throat> they decided they'd get one of those, you know, and then kind of put the name of the church and the gospel on one side and then fly it off the roof of the church and everybody would know where they were and so forth. I didn't think it was such a bad idea. Burger King had this uh, giant Shrek one time on the roof. He was huge. And I thought, I'd like to have that. You know, that'd be, put Shrek on the roof and a big sign, Calvary Chapel, Windward. But uh, <laughs> I think it was such a bad idea. But uh, 
totally in the flesh. Here's what happens in the book. He talks about, they started having all the meetings about how big the blimp should be, what it should say, what colors it should have, how long, how high they could fly it. And they went on and on for months. They finally purchased the thing. Uh, they get it up, and there's still big disagreements over it. A storm come, about blows it away. Have to get all the elders, and they're kind of trying to hang and hold on to the blimp during, during the storm and stuff. And uh, eventually, the whole church split, and, and the whole thing dissolved down to nothing. They were so focused on, on the gospel blimp, they forgot about the gospel. And uh, we can get so focused uh, on, on physical things uh, in terms of wanting to live for the Lord and and win people to the kingdom of God and so forth. We can get caught up into the, the confetti of the football game and forget that the, the real game is down there on, on the field. Pastor Chuck Smith says this. He says, when I pray, my prayers take on the nature and characteristics of a spirit force. And my prayers like a spirit can move as rapidly as thought, faster than the speed of light. And that's why many of you were able to go to China with us. <laughs> because as you pray... Your prayers were immediately there uh, with us, what was transpiring uh, in, in our lives. Uh, they were energizing uh, an angelic host that were watching over and, and protecting us. How can we put a suitcase full of Bibles on our x-ray machine, have six guys there looking in the monitors and not see the Bibles? Only if somebody blinds them. Only if somebody distracts them. It's the only way that, it, uh, that you get through. It's the only way that it happens, and it's in answer to prayer. Uh, 16, Daniel's told that the revelation concerns Israel and the future, and, uh, and that's what we're going to be covering over the, uh, the next couple of weeks, and uh, you know, again, it'll be a little bit of ancient history 101, so have your extra cup of Starbucks on the way, lots of details, but it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's so interesting because it is so incredibly accurate as he says what will happen in the future, and then we look at history, it uh, played out just the way Daniel said. And then seventh, and lastly, get an amen there. <laughs> Daniel's told that the messenger must return to the fight. Uh, so he said, do you know why I've come to you? Uh, soon I will return to the fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me uh, in, uh, against them except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect uh, him. So he mentions, uh, as I've said, he'll return to the fight against the prince of Persia. The prince of Greece will, uh, will come, and that's exactly what happens in the future. Again, Greece doesn't exist yet. <laughs> it's still yet coming. It's in the future. Uh, but uh, sort of, again, if there isn't a world empire that comes along uh, that is made up of the Greeks, and certainly uh, there was a spiritual entity that was influencing them, because we know that they persecuted the Jews uh, without, without mercy. Uh, secondly, he says he'll return to the fight because no one gives support except uh, uh, Michael. And uh, we've got another little glimpse of Michael fighting uh, from the book of Revelation. Uh, again, during the tribulation period, uh, and um, uh, this is another one of those little glimpses in, uh, in the heavenlies. It's, it's yet future because it's during the tribulation period. Uh, in there it says there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon of his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon who uh, was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. The good guys and the bad guys fighting it out. Up right now, Satan has access to heaven. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's there trying to condemn us. We see it in the book of Job. He appears before God, <coughs> accusing the brethren. God says, have you considered my servant Job? And, 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 and that whole thing uh, plays out from that, that point. But there's a point in time in the future during the great tribulation when Michael engages him for one of the, the great battles and, and, and throws him and his demonic angels to the earth. And they know their days are, are numbered uh, at that point in time. Again, he is the one that leads the whole world uh, astray. God's unique messenger here, speaking to us of some important issues. And, uh, and again, one is just that there is a battle going on in the heavenlies, and our prayers are directly tied to that. If I were God, no way. I would not do that. I would not do that. But he has. He's, he has chosen to, uh, to tie us directly 
uh, to what's taking place in, in the spiritual realm. And, uh, and so we have a tremendous responsibility. But, you know, we have tremendous power as well. And it, it, it is, you know, it is so great. It's so faith building to, to pray and pray and pray. And then you see God do something and uh, an answer and somebody's life is changed. And you see the physical as well as the spiritual evidence here, here on earth. Somebody comes to faith in Christ or they get through a difficult time. And, uh, you know, you had a, a part. It's just a whole different thing um, in my uh, in my BC days when I was going younger, going to school, Santa and Nita happened to be kind of close to where I was going, and we'd kind of mosey down there once in a while, to little, watch the horses run a little bit, and I had no idea what this was all about. I thought they were all idiots, and, uh, and the first time I watched a horse race, I'm standing there. We're in the cheap seats. There's no seats. You're standing there, and, uh, and every, you know, as soon as the bell rings, the horses go off, and now down the stretch, you know, and you know, the whole thing's on. People go nuts. They go nuts. They're screaming. They're yelling. You know, and the horses go around. And then, they, and then when it's all over, people are rejoicing. People are crying. I mean, they're crying. You know, I mean, all this has gone thinking, this is like the most idiotic thing of, close to a sporting event that I've ever seen in my life. And then someone says, well, why don't you put five bucks on one of the horses? I, that's like two giant burritos we're talking about here. You know, I'm in college. This is food, you know. Well, you know, just put it on, you know, win, place, or show. Just go for the favor. He's bound to finish at least third. You'll probably win at least 35 cents. Oh, great. Okay, I put my $5 down. Guess what I became? A screaming idiot like everybody else. Man, are you kidding? I got five bucks on this horse. I'm screaming all the way. <laughs> you know, we're a little more engaged when we've invested something in the kingdom of God. And one of the primary ways we invest into it, and there's a lot of different ways, showing God's love in physical ways to people, reaching out with his mercy and, and so forth, and, you know, being a witness for him and living honorably before him in this fallen world. But one of the ways and one of the primary ways that uh, we see here is through the engagement spiritually through, through our prayers and our prayers for for others. Again, for our own difficulties, if we're going through that issue of faith or fear, uh, realize the source of the fear, remember the promises of Jesus, and rejoice in the love of Jesus. And then thirdly, as we get into, uh, again, Israel and what happened, just realize that, that that's all a lesson to teach us of God's faithfulness. Uh, were they always faithful to him? No. Did they always keep his word? No. Did they turn his back? They're back on him time and time again? Yes. But was God still faithful? Yes. Uh, and, when, and when Paul wants to teach us, uh, you know, about, uh, about how great God's love for us, and he kind of enumerates it in Romans 8, what does he give as an example? Israel, chapter 9. They turned the back on him. <laughs> chapter 10, they're not doing real good right now. Chapter 11, ah, God comes through. They get saved in the end. He says, man, is God faithful or what? And, uh, and so it'll be a couple of good studies as we go through that in these next few weeks.